action. So, ladies and gentlemen, today one main concept on the defense of Valentine non-fit in urea. Of course, I'll be talking about two things. One, the elements that you are required to prove this defense, and second, the limitations and restrictions, either statutory or well, something other else. So, before these two things, are some brief introduction. The idea of Valenti is a complete defense in the sense that if you have successfully raised this defense and you prove it successfully, you have no liability whatsoever. And because of this, there's actually a tendency that judges do not quite like it, in the sense that the judges actually favor the apportionment brought by the contribution negligence defense. So it is um, well, it's a pity to tell you that in reality, this defense actually is rather a rarity, in the sense that it is not always successful when it's being brought to judges. So anyway, on the first bit about elements, there are three things in total. First thing being the knowledge of the risk, second being the agreement to us that you actually accept the knowledge, and the second and the third thing is on the following trainers in the sense that you by the time you make the agreement to accept the risk, you are actually doing something in a voluntary basis and nobody is forcing you to do that. So first thing, knowledge. It's not only about knowing what happens there, it's also about the nature and extent, in the sense that you know that the type of risk that you're going to bear and the type and you also know about the consequences of what will happen if you are in some unfortunate circumstances you the risk actually happened to you. And look that the knowledge uh, element is actually rather subjective in a sense that it's not about someone's reasonable standard, but it's actually about the subjective mind of a particular person, whether he know or not about the risk there. So, second thing, agreement. It can be both express and implied. Express will be some well, written form of agreement as in say I agree to the risk that will occur to me in the following hours, etc. But of course, this is rather, um, uh, it's actually not too common in, in the sense that you, you won't have somebody writing an argument to actually accept anything that will occur to him. I mean, this is rather contrary to the truth, right? So it comes to the main bit in this agreement factor in the sense that most things come down to the idea of implied agreement, in the sense that uh, the conduct will actually play a large role in this uh, idea of implied agreement. And when we look at the case of, of Morris and Murray, we see that the plaintiff is actually driving towards the airport, and he knows that he's driving, he is willing to drive there, despite he and the defendants are both drunk and are a bit tipsy. And then he is actually willing to board the plane with the defendant going to be a flyer. So we see that this conduct, despite the fact that he didn't sign anything given to the defendant, this conduct is already very sufficient to actually constitute an agreement to the risk that will actually uh, that may actually occur and occur to the particular person. So third thing, voluntary. The voluntary is about a, the plaintiff having a free and informed choice. And this idea of free and informed choice is actually made up of three things. First, there has to be sufficient information as to what will actually happen when you make a choice. Second thing is onto whether when you make a choice during this course of event, whether you are free from any duress or consequences, etc. And the third thing is that this choice must not be your only choice because if there's only one option, there's simply no option, right? This is rather a logical reasoning. So anyway, these three things constitute the elements for the idea of anti non fit in urea. First thing being the knowledge, second being the agreement to accept the risk, and also a third thing being a voluntary basis of making this agreement. So these defense, as I told you before, comes with a few restrictions. Right? The first two restrictions are mostly statutory based, in the sense that the first it will be subject to the control of exemption clauses ordinance, in the sense that these exemption clauses, if they happen to be there and happen to be signed by the plaintiff, it will actually be looked at the court and will actually be evaluated on the idea of reasonableness, rather whether this clause by the uh, like by the conscience of the judge and the jury, or etc., is actually a reasonable clause or not, and if it's a not a reasonable one, despite the agreement being signed, the judge is very likely to actually strike it down and say that there is actually no agreement at all. So, second thing on the another ordinance is the model fee codes insurance third party risk ordinances. This ordinance actually limits the scope of this volunteer agreement onto in the sense that when this when this volunteer agreement is being raised against a case of a motor vehicle accident, it is actually not really, it's actually unable to be um, allowed by the court in the sense that it's rather counterintuitive to say that, hey, when you suddenly, when you get into a car and you are actually subject to the mercy of the driver, it's very counterintuitive to say that once you get into a car, you are already agreeing to whatever risk that may happen to you. So we said these two ordinances are a great limitation on whether on, on which grounds a particular person can actually raise the defense of full and type. And of course, out of these statutory defenses, you also, you also have a tendency from the courts that when a particular person is being a rescuer, it actually 
very unlikely for a court to find that he is somehow agreeing to the risk. Because, of course, it comes down to a matter of policy, a matter of morality, of, and also it's about the social norms in the sense that it's rather unfair and rather counterintuitive to say that a particular person being there to rescue another person is actually compromising his own safety for the sake of another one's safety. So we see that this is also another big restriction for the court to actually apply. So ladies and gentlemen, what happened to you today? Uh, to do the elements for this Polentai defense comes down to three things. One, the knowledge of the risk. Second, the agreement to accept the risk. And third, the agreement is being made on a financial basis. And on the other hand, I've also told you two statutory limitations towards the defense of Polentai. One being the control of exemption clause ordinance. Second is about the motor vehicle cases where it is simply barred by the ordinance to raise any defense of this sort. And also, another part is about how rescuers is usually being treated as not really agreeing to the risk. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope that this presentation will give you a comprehensive view of the defense. Thank you.